a really informative and fun meeting. And I'd just like to start that back in 1986, Arnold Levine, who we've heard the name, he's very familiar to all of you, uh, recruited me to my first faculty position in Princeton University. And my lab was next door to Arnold's for 12 or 13 years, actually. And Arnie used to say, you know, you really need to work on P53. It's the most interesting thing out there. And I resisted and I resisted. Uh, I said, no way, never in my entire career will I work on P53. Well, here I am. Uh, so uh, Arnie was right yet again. Uh, and I'd like to thank Varda for a, a lovely talk. I learned a lot about cancer and I learned a lot about stem cells. There are things, I, I learned that there are things about stem cells that I do not know, so thank you. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today is uh, using induced pluripotent stem cells, or IPS cells, uh, to try to model leaf many syndrome uh, cancers, or associated cancers. And we heard about IPS cells briefly from Varda, uh, and uh, Unlike Varda, we don't work with uh, mice IP, mouse IPS cells, but what we do is we start with a family or pedigrees, families of leaf many patients. So families that have both mutant P53 as well as wild type uh, family members. And what we do is we take skin biopsies from these patients. So we, we do not start with tumor cells, we start with normal cells. Uh, and by using the so-called Yamanaka factors that Varda referred to, the same four factors, uh, we basically convert these cells into, uh, we induce pluripotency and convert these cells into so-called induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS cells. Uh, and then what I'll show you is we take these IPS cells, which are very similar, if not identical, to completely pluripotent embryonic stem cells, uh, although they're in many ways easier to work with because they do not come accompanied with any of the you know, bioethical or medical ethical baggage that accompanies a lot of efforts in, in human embryonic stem cells, but they're, they're essentially identical to ES cells in all ways. Uh, and then what we do is we differentiate these cells through a series of protocols into uh, ultimately into bone forming cells uh, or osteoblasts or in the case of the LFS, uh, mutant carrying individuals into cells that resemble the osteosarcoma uh, tumor that two of the uh, affected family members actually suffered from. Uh, and of course the ultimate goal is then to develop these systems as a way to, and, and this is, we're about at this stage here, uh, uh, so we start with a leaf from many family, and we generate, and there are three family members who carry a heterozygous uh, P53 point mutation in codon uh, 245, which we've heard about already. Uh, and we convert these cells to induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, and then we characterize these induced pluripotent stem cells, uh, and they have all the hallmarks of pluripotency. They express all the right genes. They have active uh, promoters in stem cell genes. Uh, they express both RNAs and proteins of all the right markers. Uh, and uh, somebody will have to advance my slides now since my remote was taken away. <laughs> Maybe I can get it back. Uh, okay, so, and of course the proof of the pudding is to really demonstrate that your IPS cells or ES cells or whatnot are pluripotent is to show that they can differentiate into all cell types of the typical uh, human or, uh, or in various case, mouse. Uh, so here are just examples of a, a couple such assays. The top panels are uh, in vitro differentiation in, in cell culture into the three main uh, germline lineages, endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm. And on the bottom are three examples of the same uh, three germ layers that differentiated after engraftment or transplantation into permissive immunocomp immunocompromised mice. Uh, so, uh, so these cells are truly pluripotent. Uh, and then 
The next slide uh, is an introduction to osteosarcoma, which is the disorder that we are going to be modeling uh, in, in a dish. Uh, and uh, so basically, just it's, it's the most common primary malignant bone neoplasm in children and young adults, uh, and, and a whole bunch of other uh, features. And the important point, one important point is all the way down at the bottom is that it's a type of undifferentiated cancer. So uh, it's caused by, an acute, by a block in differentiation, in this case to osteoblasts, to bone cells, uh, and the immature cells accumulate and are ultimately responsible for uh, the osteosarcoma. Uh, next slide. Uh, so differentiating the LFS IPS cells, the pluripotent cells, uh, three cell populations from the affected family members and two cell populations from family members who do not carry the, the mutation. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, it's a point mutation in a single amino acid in the P53, and it's a heterozygous mutation. Uh, so the first step to model the osteosarcoma is to implement protocols to differentiate these cells to intermediate mesenchymal stem cells, or MSCs, which are the precursor to osteoblasts and many other lineages. And this just shows the multi-step protocol. Uh, without going into any detail, uh, the, the proof of the pudding is that it's straightforward to generate MSC populations, and moreover, it's straightforward to propagate these cells uh, for many, many months in culture, and the cells maintain their mesenchymal stem cell-like properties. So these are, to all, uh, to the best of our ability, these are co correlate to normal mesenchymal stem cells that can be isolated from bone marrow. Uh, the next step basically shows several other markers. Uh, this slide, the next slide, uh, comparing the LFS MSCs uh, and the wild type unaffected MSCs. And uh, by all measures, these cells are normal. There's no difference between uh, leaf from many derived MSCs and wild type MSCs. Uh, the next slide uh, shows that indeed, in spite of this, the the, 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 the mutant leaf from many derived MSCs, uh, in contrast to wild type MSCs, have impaired, you can demonstrate impaired P53 function. So that's good. The phenotype of the cells is normal, they're not tumorigenic, but you can indeed show that the P53, as expected, is misregulated. Uh, and you could show that by looking at the MDM2 and P21 targets of P53, you can show normal levels of P53, nothing's elevated, nothing's too uh, messed up. Uh, the next slide shows that if you then take these MSCs and push them further to using a different set of culture conditions to the osteoblast or bone lineages, now you can show dr fairly dramatic delays in the LFS-derived MSCs in terms of the rate at which they generate ost mature osteoblasts as demonstrated by you know, a series of uh, cell surface, uh, cell markers, as well as internal gene expression markers. Uh, and the process is indistinguishable uh, in multiple LFS lines, uh, but delayed, as I said, relative to the wild type uh, MSCs. Uh, next slide uh, shows that the LFS-derived osteoblasts the ones that have just gone through this differentiation process do display cancerous properties in vitro. So you can use uh, an assay called AIG or anchorage independent growth. Uh, you can do a variety of soft agar or semi-solid media culture conditions. You can show that they form colonies. And, and again, this only happens in the osteoblast. It doesn't happen with st the starting MSCs. Uh, the next slide shows that you can use two in vivo assays to measure the cancerous properties of these cells, both LFS-derived and wild-type. So there is this assay called a CAM assay, which is you basically transplant the cells onto a chicken embryo in ovo. Uh, and on the right are the standard mouse, nude mouse, immunocompromised mouse assay, which people use routinely for measuring transformation and uh, tumorigenic properties. Uh, the next slide 
Uh, so what we did then was we showed that we can stage this differentiation process over several weeks uh, at different days. So for example, day 17, day 14, and day 21. Uh, starting with the MSCs and driving them to the osteoblast, the bone lineage. And what we can do is perform RNA-seq, or whole genome gene expression analyses, to try to figure out uh, exactly what goes wrong genome-wide with the genetic programs of these cells uh, as a consequence of this single uh, p53 point mutation. Uh, and these are just examples of ways of clustering uh, the data, and you can derive something that's called a metagene that is characteristic of a whole program of gene expression. It basically sums a bunch of different genes together. Uh, so we did that, and we showed that, indeed, we can identify numerous uh, candidate genes that might be responsible for the osteosarcoma generation in associated with the LFS-derived uh, material. Uh, and the next slide one more, uh, basically shows an example of several genes uh, and on the left there, and this is a graphic way of showing that you get delayed turning on of these genes uh, in the LFS samples relative to the wild type samples. Uh, so, and we've profiled this for probably about 20 or 25, 000, the whole genome's worth of, uh, of genes, coding, protein coding and non-coding. Um, so uh, the next slide shows that, in fact, if you do gene ontology analyses, you can show that the wild-type uh, wild derived uh, osteoblasts are enriched in bone-related uh, and differentiation, uh, skeletal differentiation genes, while as may be expected, uh, the LFS-derived material is enriched in cell cycle genes and uh, genes that promote cell proliferation. Okay, now an interesting point was that one way of analyzing these high throughput data is to ask whether one can identify a characteristic gene expression signature that's associated with a particular cell type. In this case, LFS-derived osteoblasts or wild-type family member-derived osteoblasts. And you can display this signature uh, in any of a number of ways, uh, but the fact is that you can now derive something called an osteosarcoma-associated gene signature, which basically shows you all the genes that are downregulated in the osteosarcoma relative to the wild type. So you, you have a signature like that, and typically a gene expression signature consists of about one or 200 years, or one or 200 genes, yeah, years. Uh, I'm glad there's none of my graduate students here, so uh, that's a good thing. Uh, but you, you have your signature, and what you could do then with the signature, or what we did, we went to the gene expression databases, and there weren't many, but there were about 35 or so uh, osteos bona fide osteosarcoma tumors which were profiled for gene expression genome-wide. And we asked, we, we, and these are, the individuals are shown on the top left, and one can parse these, this group of individuals into two sets. There's a set <coughs> whose gene expression profile has close similarity to our signature, which we derived from the IPS cells, and a group of patients whose osteosarcomas do not match the signature. And what you, could, you can identify the groups, subdivide the group of patients according to those criteria, and then you can go and go back to the clinical profile and ask, are there any correlations with clinical outcome? And sure enough, uh, much to our somewhat surprise, uh, you get a one-on-one -on -one perfect correlation where uh, the patients who had the signature did significantly worse in post-surgical uh, outcomes in, in relapse and whatnot. And, and this is, these data are highly significant. And why I really like this is that you, you can derive an LFS signature from a completely independent source IPSC induced pluripotent stem cell analyses, and then you can use it 
to predict the clinical outcome of, os of actual osteosarcoma patients. So this, I, I found that to be quite remarkable. But, and obviously it's not a <coughs> very large patient set, but we're clearly following this up uh, on a larger scale. Okay, now I'll just finish. Uh, how much time do I have? Four minutes? Okay, so I'll just finish by telling you about one of the genes that we've implicated uh, in osteoblast differentiation and misregulation during the osteosarcoma development. And this is a gene called H19. It codes for a non-coding long RNA, and nobody really knows what it does, and it was discovered by my former colleague, Shirley Tillman, uh, at Princeton University back in the mid-'80s. And H19 has been implicated both as a tumor suppressor and as a pro-oncogenic molecule uh, in various labs in various cellular contexts. So the role of this gene is unclear. Uh, and, but we did show that H19 is massively upregulated in wild-type osteoblast differentiation time courses, and it's absolutely flatlined in the differentiation time courses from the leaf from many samples. So clearly this was something that we were very interested in following up, and we did. And in fact, the human version of H19 maps to the 11P15.5 locus, and it's associated with Beckman-Wiedemann syndrome as well as Russell, Russell Silver syndrome, and basically this is just a diagram of the locus. Now, uh, we showed that the H19 promoter is effectively repressed by the, the tumor suppressor P53, so that, that made some sense. Uh, and we came up with a model, which turns out to be wrong, that uh, the mutant P53 sits together as a tetramer uh, with wild type P53, and it locks down H19 in a more or less permanent state of off. Uh, now, without going into too, much, too many details, uh, we went on to show that H19, using both loss of function RNAi techniques and overexpression, we showed that normal H19, in fact, controls osteogenesis or bone formation. So this was good because it, it put now H19 functionally downstream of P53. And in fact, uh, H19 add back or gain of function uh, in uh, LFS osteoblasts or cells that are on the way to becoming osteosarcoma, in fact, rescues the normal differentiation properties of these cells. So it basically blocks the ability of these cells to read out in, in tumorigenic assays. Uh, and in fact, it also inhibits the ex, ex ovo and ex vivo uh, tumor genesis models in both the chicken uh, as well as in immuno immunodeficient mice. Uh, and this just shows more data that are consistent with this. Uh, so we believe that the P53 G245D mutant actually behaves as a gain of function mutation in essentially permanently locking down or repressing the expression of H19. And we, we really don't know yet what H19 is actually doing, but uh, we, we have all the functional assays and biochemical assays in place. Uh, so basically this is just what I said, and uh, I'm running out of time, I'm sure. So I'll just end. Uh, I would tell you a lot more, but in the interest of time, I won't. Uh, so basically, this is the summary. We've generated and characterized uh, IPS cells, both from leaf from many uh, patients and wild-type family members. Uh, we've been able to recapitulate many, probably not all, of the characteristics of the osteosarcoma that two of the patients, two of the family members actually suffered from in our pedigree. Uh, and um, we've been able to analyze genome-wide uh, transcriptome and basically map out what the gene expression signatures are that are associated with the single P53. Uh, and we've been able to implicate H19 and this other gene, Decorin, uh, which is part of the imprinted gene network in uh, LFS-associated osteosarcoma. So we've got a lot to do. 
We've got a lot going on. We obviously have uh, samples from uh, other families with distinct, uh, different p53 mutations. Uh, and so we're very busy. And these are some of the people who did the work. Dong Fang Li, who it was a, an unbelievably gifted postdoc in the lab, who has his own lab now in Houston. Uh, Ji Su, who was a, a terrific graduate student who worked closely with Dong Fang, uh, other members of the lab, and at the University of Alberta, Dr. Mir Dr. Razmik Mirzayans. So uh, if I have time, I'll take questions. If not, you can ask me later. Thank you. Maybe I missed this, but do you have any mechanistic in, um, insight into how the um, mutant p53 is activating the long non cord the H19 uh, um, link? Well, yeah, we do. We have a little bit. Uh, we know that it's doing it indirectly. So there's something else that comes into play and interacts with mutant p53, and that's one of the projects ongoing right now is to pinpoint what, what that other factor actually is. Uh, but we're pretty confident that it requires something else. Thank you.